dramatic, yeah, for, for us here with the bushfires. I'm in the Blue Mountains west of Sydney, and then with this on top of it, it's been... Yes. <clears throat> Absolutely. All right, well, it's 7.015 o'clock in the morning for you, so we shouldn't tarry. I should get on with um, introducing the event and uh, tell them... Take, take your time. ...everything that we're doing. Yeah, take your time. I'm awake. Very good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for that for starting. Uh, for everyone on the uh, who's who's joining us and uh, everyone already on, my name is Luke Whitington. I'm the executive officer of the Search Foundation, and I'm your host for the event. Uh, before we begin, please be aware that this briefing is being recorded, so we can post it later to the Search Foundation YouTube channel. Um, I'm just going to make sure I am on the screen just for the moment, just for the for that um, YouTube. Purposes. There we go. So, uh, before we begin, uh, we always begin with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging, as we always do, that we're meeting here in Australia on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land. Sovereignty of this land was never ceded. I pay my respects to elders and leaders, past, present, and emerging, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples traditional owners and First Nations all across the continent. I'm on Gundungurra and Darug land, where we say, Warami Gamarada, welcome comrades. It's a real treat to have Bill Fletcher Jr. with us on this Zoom conference to talk about the prospects for the left in the USA. But before we get to that, uh, I'm gonna do a quick valet for Jack Mundy. Uh, many of the people joining us for this event were friends, comrades and acquaintances of the legendary Australian unionist, Jack Mundy. Jack was a search member, and this is the first event search is holding since Jack passed away last night at the age of 90. The search members will have received a valet written by Jack's friend and comrade, Byron Ahrens. That has also been posted on the search Facebook and Twitter. I'll post a link to it in the chat section momentarily. I encourage you to read it, share it, and comment with your own recollections of Jack. It best covers Jack's enormous contribution to the life of this country, to the left, and the union movement. I won't try and summarise it here, uh, partly because I couldn't possibly do Jack justice in the time available. Instead, we will commemorate Jack at a future event. Details of the commemoration event will be sh shared as soon as we have them. Suffice to say, at this point, condolences to Judy Mundy particularly, and all of Jack's family, his friends, comrades and colleagues. We won't hold a moment silence now. Uh, there'll be time for that at a later date. For now, we're gonna talk union business and politics, and I think Jack would approve. First, I'll tell everyone about the event, then I'll give a 30 second intro to search and then a one minute introduction to Bill Fletcher Jr. Bill will then speak for around 25 minutes. After that, we will have questions, which I invite you to submit in writing in the chat section to me directly. We will wrap up on the hour, although we may go a little bit over time if uh, Bill's happy to do that. Um, when you can hang up or stay on the line for a few minutes to listen to uh, a song which is rapidly becoming a favourite part of these briefings, judging from the feedback we have received after recent talks. To enable us to run this efficiently, all participants will be muted unless called upon to ask a question. After you have asked your question, please mute yourself again. The chat section is limited to messages to me as the host, otherwise I won't be able to collate questions coming through. At the end of the meeting, you will be able to message everyone, including Bill, and post any links or points you would like to make. However, if you would like to discuss what is being said during the event, you can comment on the Facebook event page discussion board. I'll post the link for that in the chat section shortly. You'll have to use Facebook and Zoom at the same time, but hopefully that's not beyond your tech capabilities. So a quick intro to SEARCH. SEARCH is a membership-based democratic socialist organisation that links and enables socialist activists across political parties, generations and movements all around Australia. We have members coming out of different and diverse backgrounds and interests, but we have common aims and values, summarised in our aim of democratic ecological socialism. We run socialist program, education programs, publish news and views on Facebook and at search.org.au, and we put on events like this one. I encourage you to like the Search Facebook page to keep up with our events and go to search.org.au if you're interested in applying for membership or simply get in touch with me to talk about what Search does. Our contact details are on our website and our Facebook page. So to introduce Bill. Bill Fletcher Jr. is the executive editor of Global African Worker and the author of They're Bankrupting Us and 20 Other Myths About Unions. 
having been an activist and other books which I'll mention in a moment. Having been an activist since his teen years, upon graduating from college, Bill went to work as a welder in a shipyard, thereby entering the labour movement. Over the years, he has been active in workplace and community struggles, as well as electoral campaigns. He has worked for several US labour unions, in addition to serving as a senior staff member in the national peak body, AFL-CIO. Bill Fletcher is the former president of Trans Africa Forum, a senior scholar with the Institute for Policy Studies, an editorial board member of blackcommentator.com, and involved uh, in the leadership of several other projects. He's also the co-author with Peter Agard of The Indispensable Ally, Black Workers and the Formation of the Congress of Industrial Organisations, 1934 to 1941. And the co-author with Dr. Fernando Capazan of Solidarity Divided, The Crisis in Organised Labour and a New Path Towards Social Justice. He's also published a mystery novel, The Man Who Fell From The Sky, and of interest to many search members, he's the author and co-editor of a book on the legacy of Amilcar Cabral, the leader of the independence movement of Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde. The title of that is Claim No Easy Victories. We'll post the link to that on Facebook in, in the chat section shortly. He's a regular commentator, writer and talk, talk show host and activist. You can follow him on Twitter and Facebook and at BillFletcherJr.com, where he regularly posts on current issues, including most recently a really great uh, response to the right-wing protesters who demand immediate reopening. I really encourage you to read that one. Tonight, Bill will discuss how the US left, labour and progressive movements are responding to the Trump administration's hardline hard right agenda to remake the USA in its image. He will speak broadly on questions such as what are the left's prospects and priorities? How can Trump be defeated? What has the Bernie Sanders movement achieved? And how could the left influence a potential Biden Democratic administration? So thanks again for joining us live at 5am. Over to you, Bill. All right, good. Um, well, I guess I would say uh, good afternoon because I think uh, with the time difference, um, you're in the afternoon and I'm just getting up. Uh, so forgive me that I'm not uh, exactly chipper as a chipmunk, but um, it's really good to be uh, with you. And I've been looking forward to this, not getting up at four in the morning, but uh, been being with you. Uh, I was trying to think of the best use of your time um, because everything that I'm being asked to address could take us several hours. And um, now that I'm up, I'm ready to do that. But I don't think that that'd be the best use of your time. So what I figured I would do, I just completed writing an essay uh, called After the Sanders Campaign, The Struggle for Power Continues, that I think summarizes much of what uh, Brian and I discussed as a possibility for a presentation. And I thought it might be a little bit more coherent and a good jumping off point for what is usually my favorite part of, of this, which is the discussion of back and forth with you. So let me just read this and then we'll just go from there. As I said, it's uh, entitled After the Sanders Campaign, The Struggle for Power Continues. It's going to be published, uh, I think within another couple of months in a journal called New Politics. The campaign of Senator Bernie Sanders has been one of the most exhilarating moments in recent US political history, irrespective of his not capturing the Democratic Party nomination. The mobilization capacity, as well as the ability to shift the national discussion has had and will continue to have a lasting impact. In the interest of time and space, we shall, we shall identify certain important takeaways from the campaign and then offer recommendations on a possible road forward. First, the narrative. The Sanders campaign successfully articulated a narrative describing and explaining the declining living standard of the vast majority of the people of the United States. It also expanded from its relatively narrow framework in 2016 to address foreign policy. It also expanded its discussions about race Though at key moments, it continued to come across as an add-on as opposed to an integral component, that is race. Mobilizing youth. 
The campaign was once again successful in inspiring youth, including youth of color. Youth became central to the campaign, campaign, including in staffing. At the same time, the campaign leadership misestimated its ability to bring into the campaign previously non-voting youth and non-voting elders for that matter. This misestimation may have led the campaign to underestimate the strategic importance of the South, the South of the United States. The campaign still did not get the South and the movements of people of color. By get, I mean understand. Perhaps one of the greatest weaknesses of the campaign and a weakness of much of the US left and progressive forces was the lack of a Southern strategy. This was linked with, though autonomous from, a larger weakness regarding an underappreciation of the strategic significance of racist and national oppression as central to the operation of US capitalism and their misestimation of the corresponding movements opposing such oppression. The lack of a Southern strategy is very curious considering the deficiencies in this arena in the 2016 Sanders campaign. Me, while one might be able to argue that in 2016, Sanders and his core were never prepared for the response that they received and therefore had not appreciated the significance of the US South. In a 2020 campaign, there was no such excuse. Since 2016, Sanders has had plenty of time to move South and unite with the various movements in that region, most especially the African-American movement. Inexplicably, this did not happen with the South Carolina primary demonstrating what can happen when the South is ignored. We're now in a post-Sanders moment and not only have to assess the campaign, but also look at our immediate and long-term challenges. The most immediate and surprisingly controversial within left circles task is, the, is to de, uh, the defeat of Trump. This has become controversial in part due to a lack of a dialectical and historically grounded electoral strategy within much of the left, as well as a tendency within the left to define acceptable electoral politics in terms of who is close to us? Let me propose an alternative framework by way of analogy. The partisans of what became known as the New Right in the late 1960s, example, people like Richard Vigory, were deeply ideological right-wingers who debated whether to form a third party, in part due to the popular response received by the campaigns of Alabama Governor George Wallace, an extreme right-winger. Instead, they opted to work both inside and outside of the Republican Party, and in 1968 allied with an individual they despised, Richard Nixon. Surprisingly to some, the new right, which existed as a fusion of right-wing populists, secular and religious, and economic conservatives, perceived Nixon as a political liberal. Nevertheless, they were prepared to unite with him as a means of advancing their agenda. What form did advancing their agenda take? Through measures such as court appointments, the use of the media, appointments to agencies, and a greater role in the Republican Party, the New Right expanded its influence. The New Right seized on Nixon's Southern strategy to build the Republicans as the non-Black party. Indeed, to build it as the right-wing party of the white republic. But the New Right had an outside element as well. He seeded and helped to instigate mass movements around guns, abortion, housing, uh, excuse me, busing, and the Panama Canal, frequently uniting the cores of these movements. It took on court battles against affirmative action, abortion, and women's rights generally, and they identified trained and, and trained candidates to run for office in both partisan and nonpartisan races. None of this demonstrated any love for the Republican Party on the part of the New Right. They recognized the Republican Party as a battlefield within which they could engage at a battlefield where they were more likely to win rather than going the third party route, which Wallace had once suggested. Through a long-term struggle, they chased liberals out of the Republican Party and effectively turned it into a hard right-wing party. Within the US left, we're a bit more confused. 
Due to an understandable hatred of the capitalist leadership of both parties, many of us assume that the answer to the electoral dilemma for the left resides in the construction of a third party, a party that will hopefully be progressive. Our strategies for the actual construction of such a party are largely non-existent, or take the form of assertions rather than strategy, or one-time independent runs, or relatively low-level and or nonpartisan campaigns. What is characteristic of far too many of our electoral efforts is that we engage depending on how close we see a candidate being to our politics, rather than making an assessment as to whether a particular candidate or campaign can advance a progressive agenda that we are helping to articulate. It is this disconnect which makes it difficult for many progressives to understand the support from large segments of the right that someone like Donald Trump can receive despite his many foibles. The right-wing theocrats are clear, however, they recognize his weaknesses, but they see all of us as sinners, as one young Catholic leader said in 2016, and or believe that Trump exists as a blunt force instrument to advance the agenda of their movement. In that sense, they care little for the candidate's strengths and weaknesses and are completely hypocritical when, for instance, they attack a progressive for lack of so-called family values, but will stand by and ignore the lack of those same family, so-called family values, on the part of someone who will go nameless, who advances their agenda. In addition to strategic confusion and differences, many of us on the left have different appreciations of this historical moment and the social forces in play. Using arguments such as democratic center-rightists laid the basis for Trump, an incomplete truism, or that a non-Sanders Democrat will simply capitulate and fail to carry forward a progressive agenda. Many leftists are proposing to take a pass on voting in November or to vote third party, effectively contributing to Trump's reelection. What is missed is the nature of the mass movement that Trump represents. We are not dealing with a simple conservative politician who advances reactionary stands, yet plays by the rules of bourgeois politics. We're dealing with an administration that is thoroughly corrupt, on top of which it encourages a broader right-wing populist movement, including but not limited to neo-fascists, that is revanchist in nature and seeks to obliterate much of what has been won in the 20th century. They also have an armed wing. This is no hyperbole, as anyone looking soberly at that which the Trump administration has moved since the 2017 can attest. Whether Trump is himself a fascist is secondary to an understanding of the objectives of the larger movement. The movement, this movement of his, is deeply rooted in U.S. history, and as such, one does not need to look to European 1930-ish fascism to find a model. The U.S. South during the era of Jim Crow segregation and the Southwest during the same time span were excellent examples of highly repressive one party, white supremacist, anti-women, anti-worker, xenophobic regimes. Trump and his base are as American as cherry pie, to borrow from the former h rap Brown. To understand what the right wing populists seek to win, one need only look at contemporary Hungary, Poland, Turkey, or for that matter, Russia. The aim is to smash dissent and to ensure that even if there are the outer appearances of political democracy, the essence of the state will be right-wing authoritarian rule. And that rule, one should add, though using the guise of populism advances the objectives of capitalism, be that a transnational capitalist slash domestic capitalist alliance, or in the case of the more fascist element, a hoped for national capitalist resurgence. Thus our immediate task is the forging of a broad front to defeat Trump. Defeating Trump necessitates that the Democratic candidate win. This does not mean simply voting against Trump. It means that Trump and Republicans in Congress must be soundly defeated, which leads us to a second short and long-term task, down-ballot races. Much of the left only focuses on elections during the presidential years. This means that we have no strategy, but instead 
as we would say in New York City when I was a kid, we engage in the selling of woof tickets. Woof tickets meaning woof woof. Electoral strategy necessitates electoral organization and not just program. That said, the left would be in a much stronger place if it helped in the construction of a working people's agenda that was developed through the direct involvement of members and activists from within the movements of working people in the US. We're talking about labor unions, tenant groups, food cooperatives, social clubs, et cetera, that are rooted within the working class. The development of a working people, excuse me, the development of working people's agendas in local and state settings helps to codify a certain level of political consciousness and quote unquote common sense. The working people's agenda becomes the instrument or litmus test when identifying political candidates. But such an agenda cannot be the work of one group of leftists alone, regardless of how strong they happen to be or think that they are. It must be a political task that is addressed in a thoroughly anti-sectarian manner. Thus, there is a need for two levels of organization in order to build an independent progressive movement. One, a national left project. Two, a mass electoral initiative capable of working inside and outside of the Democratic Party. With regard to the national left project, the fragmented US left lacks organization to address the scale and scope of our tasks. By polling estimates, there may be as many as 70 million people in the United States who are open to alternatives to capitalism. Even an organization with the size of the Democratic Socialists of America is dwarfed by such a challenge. And the problem is not simply that most of our organizations are small or now in extinct, but that we think of organization on a small scale. To build an organization capable of tapping into at least 70 million people, we're talking about moving toward a mass radical left political organization that whether it calls itself a party or not, becomes the political home for thousands of activists engaged in various social movements. But as a home, it must have a strategy rather than being a way station. Otherwise it runs the risk of being a brain dead confederation. A national left project will by necessity be multi-tenancy and we'll have to accept that not every contemporary and historical question will be able to be answered immediately, but it must have sufficient unity in order to operate effectively in the real world. This means a sound electoral strategy, a recognition of the nature of the US capitalist state, an unwavering commitment to opposition to racist and national oppression, an unwavering commitment to opposition to male supremacy, practice of firm internationalism, and a deep belief in the importance of the United Front at both the strategic and tactical levels. It certainly must be an organization that is democratic and promotes debate, but is capable of marching in a common direction when decisions are made. What is critical about such a project or organization is that it operates in multiple social movements, attempting in each case to build an anti-sectarian left pole in said movements that is capable of leading said movements. Whether operating among the unemployed, building worker cooperatives, fighting police brutality, engaged in struggles for land rights, supporting the women's right to choose, advancing a Green New Deal, or supporting oppressed peoples in foreign lands, this organization must put its brand on the work. Yet this is not enough. Progressive mass electoral formations are also essential. Organizations such as the Working Families Party, the New Virginia Majority, California Calls, the New Florida Majority, and Progressive Democrats of America are all examples of formations engaged in work inside and outside of the Democratic Party. These are not organizations of the Democratic Party, but what could almost be described as non-party parties or independent political organizations that have or are developing clear constituencies and base areas, and through that, moving a progressive majoritarian agenda. The Democratic Party is only a battlefield rather than the final goal. The Sanders campaigns of 2016 and 2020, much like the Jesse Jackson campaigns of 1984 and 1988, inspired millions with the vision of an alternative politics and an alternative political practice, breaking from both cynicism and traditional political liberalism. 
Regardless of the outcome of the November 2020 elections, the tasks identified here must be fulfilled. Otherwise, the U.S. left will continue spinning, this time into the heart of the maelstrom. So thank you. Um, I will, if you'd like, just open up to questions. Thank you. Um, we've got a fair few questions coming through. People should continue to send them to me uh, via the, the chat section. <clears throat> um, I've got a question from Sue, which is quite uh, a bit dramatic. I don't know if I can get Sue on the uh, unmute her and, and put the video on her just at this point. Um, but I will I'll ask the question on her behalf. Um, you know, for, I can see why she's asking this from the news images we get, which is, do you, Bill, see the possibility of, of civil war in the United States, of um, perhaps civil, you know, severe civil unrest? There seems to be little appetite for differing sides to listen to each other and uh, your populace is armed. Um, seems like there's a bit of a shoot first, ask questions later attitude. Um, we're in a period that uh, someone who I, I don't remember who coined it, but I use the term, um, is that we're in a cold civil war right now. And um, this has been growing for quite some time. Uh, a hot civil war has been the objective of various fascists over the years, uh, going back to at least the, the so-called Minutemen in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, but you could see it in the 1980s to be with the proliferation of neo-fascist groups in the United States, in the Midwest and in the Northwest, groups like uh, the Pase Comitatus, the Aryan Nation and others. Um, and then the growth of militias, which you started to see in the 90s, uh, the terrorist attack carried out by Timothy McVeigh um, in Oklahoma City are all examples of these forces. They are there. They have, in some sense, always been there. Um, now, the, what, what has happened over time is that the Republican establishment, as it has moved further to the right, and as the forces that I identified as the new right became successful in hardening the right-wing character of the Republican Party, the Republican establishment became uh, very opportunistic in tapping into right-wing populist sentiment and movements, assuming that they could control this movement. And the metaphor of Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein and a monster, is very applicable here, in that Dr. Frankenstein, according to the story, um, believed that he could create life from death. And uh, he, in assembling this uh, being, uh, believed that he could keep control over that being not realizing that once that being became self-aware, that it would have its own set of objectives. And much of that has happened in the United States with this right-wing populist movement, which so shocked the Republican establishment in 2016, uh, when this movement gravitated towards an advanced the candidacy of Trump. Trump is very much like Berlusconi, um, corrupt, uh, right wing, um, there's probably no principle that he adheres to other than make it self-interest um, and is willing to align himself with the most nefarious of forces and providing them with various kinds of ideological support. So uh, most recently, when the uh, there were the appearance of these very well orchestrated but orchestrated right-wing demonstrations calling for the opening the reopening of the economy uh trump contrary to the advice of his own white house 
was supporting these actions, including the fact that some elements showed up with guns. Now, um, I don't know whether there's a parallel in Australia, but I would say that if you had a series of demonstrations in the United States by African Americans, uh, Latinos and indigenous, let's say, and we showed up with guns, you could almost be guaranteed that we would be massacred. A minimum people would be arrested. But what these right-wing uh, paramilitary organizations have done has been to normalize the appearance of guns and the threat of violence in right-wing demonstrations. Um, now, the situation becomes very complicated because within the U.S. state, there, uh, there is, um, from what I could tell, no real interest in a civil war. There are opportunist elements, and there's certainly, I'm sure, that there are elements that would like to have some sort of military coup or something. But um, there's not, I don't, I don't get the sense that there's a lot of interest in a civil war. There's a lot of discontent in the U.S. military with Trump. Uh, and this was displayed in certain dramatic ways when the captain of this aircraft carrier, uh, after being ignored about the spread of COVID-19 within his crew, was removed. And the crew, um, I think, they almost mutinied. Uh, but they certainly gave the captain a fond uh, farewell when he was removed. And then, essentially, he was reinstated. Um, the, uh, there are these differences. The intelligence community um, has no love for Trump. And uh, in part because Trump has humiliated them, um, not by revealing any level of incompetence on their part, but just mocking them. So I would say that if things broke, if, if some sort of civil conflict breaks out, um, it's not clear where the military would go. Um, I, my guess is that there would be significant splits within the repressive apparatus of the state. Um, National Guards, the full military, uh, even the police, I think, would be unreliable on both sides. So it's a, it's a very ugly situation. And this is one of the reasons that the defeat of Trump becomes so important. And my tolerance for elements of the left, including people associated, I'll name them, with Jacobin Magazine. Uh, I have very little tolerance for what I think to be an amateurish look at the political scene. It's a long answer, forgive me. Uh, it's a very interesting answer, and thank you for that. We had a similar question from uh, Darren McDonald, which we might be able to get back to later, but here's a very short one, uh, which Go a bit to the electoral um, coalition idea and the left getting behind Joe Biden from Helen Hewitt. Will Biden beat Trump? I think the first question is whether Biden will be the nominee. And then the second question is whether he could defeat Trump. Um, so let me work backwards. I think that Biden can absolutely defeat Trump, even with the problems that Biden is facing right now. Um, and I think he can defeat Trump in part because the, this election will in large part be a, uh, an election between sanity and insanity. And there, uh, there is this incredible ad that was created by Republicans called Morning in America, a takeoff on Ronald Reagan's 1984 
uh, campaign theme, but spelled differently. These folks spell mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. And it is, an, it is an unbelievable denunciation of um, Trump. And, and uh, when you see it, it's, it just rings true. And I'm saying that as a leftist looking at it, I say, wow. You know? um, so I think that uh, Biden could absolutely defeat Trump. Now, going back to the, uh, the first part, though, the... It is not at all clear to me that it's settled that Biden will be the nominee. And the reason is uh, in part because of these uh, allegations around sexual misconduct. Um, I'm not sure what I think about the allegations. Uh, my, my general stand is when these allegations are ever made, they must be investigated thoroughly. But an allegation does not mean the truth. And I think that there has been a tendency here in the United States that's been quite unfortunate to assume that allegations equal the truth. And, um, and I know that that's not the case um, as a general principle. So, um, so it's not clear to me what's really going on here on multiple levels. But the allegations may be sufficient that Biden will be forced to step down. And if that happens, all bets are off in terms of who the nominee will be. Uh, it is far from clear that it would be Sanders. And uh, because what we have to understand and what many U.S. leftists won't accept is that Sanders simply, he lost. It wasn't like the nomination was taken away from him. He lost. That the um, non-Sanders candidates at the end of the day decided to uh, throw their weight behind Biden when they realized that they were gonna lose, and that while for a while, Sanders had the plurality, was ahead by the plurality, he did not have the majority of the party, of the voters. Um, and, and so it is quite conceivable that the Democratic Party convention could result in a new nominee and a completely different ticket. It could be a Cuomo from the governor of New York. Um, it might be the resurrection of one of the candidates, other candidates. Um, it might be a Sanders ticket and Kamala Harris or something. I mean, there's any number of possibilities. This is one of the reasons that this, uh, it's not over. It's, it, and uh, Sanders in that sense is correct to say that he wants to continue to accumulate delegates as he approaches the convention, not because he uh, is going to contest Biden, but he wants to be in an ideal position to push for answers and to push for um, platform. So, uh, yeah, I, I, so going back to the original question, I definitely think that uh, Trump can lose. I mean, what you have to understand, um, my starting point is that about 25% of the U.S. electorate <clears throat> is worthless. I call them zombies. And as a, a student of zombies, I can tell you a few things about zombies. Uh, once, someone, once a human becomes a zombie, they never can return to being a human. And if you doubt that, watch any good science fiction movie. Um, once a zombie, you're stuck as a zombie. And the, the thing that um, we have to understand is that there is perhaps 20, 25% of the electorate that really are bad, that are thoroughly right wing, that are not convincible of anything. Um, 
Jesus could make a reappearance walking side by side with Lenin, and that would not change the attitude of the core of the Trump movement. Um, so you've got that to begin with. Then you have other kinds of people around them that for a variety of reasons have been very influenced by Trump um, and particularly based on issues of race and immigration. Um, and also based on the fear in the middle strata of being crushed by both the people at the bottom and the people at the top. Um, now, in this situation appears COVID-19. And the level of incompetence demonstrated by the Trump administration has really been unbelievable. I, I, uh, I saw something, I can't remember, some right winger uh, speaking favorably of Trump said that the response of the administration has been unprecedented. And actually they were right. There has been never an administration, as far as I can tell, that has been so completely incompetent in its response to a disaster as the Trump administration. And this has scared people. Um, Trump has basically thrown up his hands and left it to the uh, governors. And as uh, in a recent article in the Atlantic magazine put it very uh, clearly, that once Trump and the Republican leadership realize that the disproportionate numbers of people dying and suffering from COVID-19 were Blacks and Lat African Americans and Latinos, poor people, working people, uh, they became less concerned about this uh, crisis. And I would argue uh, are, are implementing a social Darwinist approach. The, this scares a lot of people. And it appears to even be scaring some of his, some, many of his supporters. So this election, regardless of what the polls may say on any one day, is far from over. We had a question, in fact, about the, um, there was a, <clears throat> we've got a TV channel here, the uh, National Indigenous TV Network, which carried a story from the Maori perspective in New Zealand about the high rate of deaths of uh, Native Americans um, due to COVID-19. So um, I think you've effectively referred to that there. <clears throat> um, I have a question from uh, Pat Hovey. Hopefully Pat is all right to ask that directly. Um, oh, did I unmute myself? I've unmuted you, Comrade. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, Bill. Uh, my question is, what the, what's the role of the organised labour movement in, camp, in the campaign to defeat Trump? And I'm, I'm thinking, rather than just of that cult of personality of that Trump is, but, but the very wide sub community support that he, he seems to have, which is so alarming. To, um, to people, you know, on the left in the progressive movements. I have just to add to that a question from Dan who asked, on a similar line, in order to defeat the right, what do you think unions should focus on to gain votes for the left? So the role of the unions and what you think they should be focusing on. Okay. Um, before answering that, you, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned the indigenous. And let me just add to my last comments that, um, there are tribes in the United States that um, are possibly facing annihilation as a result of COVID-19. Um, and that is getting very little media attention. Um, in terms of the questions, um, the answer to this is complicated because it's sort of a pre-COVID 19 economic collapse answer and then a current answer. So pre-COVID-19, um, part of what was happening was that a number of unions were recognizing that their approach in the 2016 election had been 
ridiculous, if not stupid, uh, by a early endorsement of Hillary Clinton and the failure to conduct and recognize real debates within the membership, including pro-Sanders forces at the time and pro-Trump forces. And uh, a number of unions suffered as a result. Uh, and by suffering, I mean not simply that uh, large portions of their membership voted for Trump, but that the leadership no longer knew who their members were. And, uh, and so this go around, there has been much more caution. And in some cases, some unions decided they were not going to make an endorsement until there was uh, a vote or something among their, within their membership, or uh, at least down the road. So that um, also, unfortunately, was tied to a continued lack of consistent internal education. So it's, it's almost like some of the unions threw up their hands and said, we're agnostic. Um, and this is, this is a really big mistake. So now what's happened with COVID uh, is that the traditional methods of me, campaigning are off. And the large rallies, uh, membership meetings. So there, there's a greater reliance on uh, electronic technology and social media, et cetera. Um, and it is unclear to me as we go down the road what the unions actually are going to do. Although my guess is that by September, they will figure out a major mobilization behind whoever the Democratic candidate will be. I think most unions will, will back uh, the Democratic candidate. Um, so what should they be doing? What they should have been doing all along is engaging our members in real discussions about the dangers of right-wing populism including issues about race and gender uh, and xenophobia. And the, um, the problem is that, the problem is, is uh, illustrated by the way most unions have traditionally dealt with trade policies. Um, the articulation of protectionism ends up fitting very well with Trump's rhetorical agenda, so much so that in 2016, you had a real problem in the ranks of the unions where members were saying, well, wait a minute, Trump is saying what you guys have been saying. And because the unions had narrowed their critique of neoliberal globalization, largely to trade policies, they were befuddled. Um, so the or education around right-wing populism has to be much more comprehensive. And, uh, and so that's one thing. Um, the, um, there, there has to be a demonstration, and I think we can do it through what's happening in response to COVID, of the cavalier nature of this administration with the lack of attention to personal protective equipment, um, the willingness to sacrifice people on the altar of capitalism. I mean, these are all clear for all to see and the union movement can play a great role on that. Um, we, the union movement should at this point be leading a broad united front against Trump and against 
these various policies that have been conducted right now uh, by his administration in response to the crisis. So that means really leading campaigns around things like some sort of guaranteed income, uh, free health care, um, a moratorium on uh, mortgage payments and rents. And I think that these are the kinds of campaigns that can energize the base and point them in the right direction. Ah, but here we run into a tactical problem. In this period of COVID, how do you do all this when we're supposed to be socially distancing ourselves? Because unless you want to take the point of view of the lunatic right, which is that we don't really have to worry about people getting ill or that COVID-19 is really just a bad flu, we have to be concerned about people getting sick. Now, some progressives, uh, progressive forces, including some unions like the National Nurses United, have not let COVID-19 stop them from mass actions. They're, the mass actions are just highly disciplined. So there will be events where people are six feet apart from one another. I guess that's like, like two meters or something, um, separating uh, one another. And, and doing that in a very disciplined way. Another, another thing which really appeals to me, and some people have done it, have been car caravans, uh, automobile caravans. And um, this is something that progressives should be using much more, including in electoral campaigning. You know, we don't have as many, I don't know whether you have, whether you, whether you use drive-in theaters in Australia. It used to be just very common in the United States. And over time, the number of places have shrunk. But that's a hell of a great place to have rallies uh, in this time of COVID. Um, you can have the rallies in drive-in theaters. Um, but you could also do demonstrations that would be highly effective and certainly very noisy if you have car caravans that are driving through cities and are respecting the speed limit, which usually most U.S. drivers don't. But if you're actually respecting the speed limit, you could have like 100 cars, 200 cars, that will just simply shut things down because of how long it's going to take for those cars to go through every traffic light. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things we have a fight right now, because Trump is trying to destroy the U.S. Postal Service. And one thing I suggested to someone in, uh, from one of the unions was that there could be a car caravan that goes to Washington, D.C., from all over the United States and basically surrounds the White House and, you know, and Capitol Hill. Um, so we have to be innovative. And, uh, and so there's many things that the union movement can do. Now, we, we have no idea what's gonna happen with COVID-19 this fall, well, for that matter, this summer. Um, my prediction, is that the way things are going right now, I think that the economy is going to be reopened irrespective of what the public health authorities are saying. Um, the argument is going to be, the argument that's been raised since, raised since the beginning of March, which is that uh, we can't shut down permanently and people are going to die. And the strong will survive. Uh, and I think that because of who is being affected by this disproportionately, there will be a willingness to reopen the economy, reopen various things that right now are closed, and, um, and try the pretense of normality. Now, that may mean a return to rallies. 
Now, if the COVID reemerges in the fall, all bets are off. And that includes <clears throat> the possibility that Trump might try to postpone the election. which used to be the worry only of the left, but now has been a worry that's gotten into the mainstream Democratic Party. Very inter interesting you mentioned that. We've had quite a few questions that have just come through on that. In fact, we're getting so many questions that um, now that we're five minutes to uh, the hour, we might not be able to get to them all, um, but I have a more- My, my time is flexible. You're okay to go on for a little bit? Yeah. All right, that's yeah. fine. thank you. Um, well, I will ask uh, Arma Samaratna to ask her question, if that's okay. Go ahead, Arma. Oh, well, I think you touched on this, actually. Um, basically, what are your thoughts and, I guess, criticism of the labour movement currently? What I'm experiencing, in, rather than the frontline workers, a whole bunch of workers are increasingly atomized because businesses are obviously spending money to isolate them. They're probably not going to go back to the way things were because it's cheaper for the businesses. How do we basically engage workers on defeating Trump, on all of these sort of right-wing rhetoric in this completely isolated environment? And this is obviously a separate group of workers that are not on the front line, but you know, they're a big population. Yeah. Um, hmm. Just trying to think of where to begin. Um, I think that, um, I don't know whether this is going to be a good answer, but I'll give it anyway. Um, I think that part of what the labor movement needs to do right now, the, the trade union movement and the rest of the labor movement, is precisely to break down people's isolation. And that needs to operate on several levels, some of which people are doing. Uh, so there, is, there are various forms of mutual aid, uh, which is happening around the world, of you know, units of people making sure that everyone is getting food, that they're getting the medical supplies, uh, that they see a human being. Um, there's, uh, a number of organizations, like I'm, uh, one of the, I'm in, I actually a member of three unions, but I'm, uh, one of the unions I'm in is the National Writers Union. And our chapter has begun having weekly calls using Zoom, uh, to put people in touch with one another and have discussions about various issues. And while many people are getting tired of Zoom, um, I think it's been indispensable. I mean, I find myself thinking about what might have happened if this was 1990. Um, I, I think a lot of people would have simply lost their minds. And um, so, so I think that that's part of what has to happen. Um, I think that the, I'm having trouble answering your question because I'm thinking about a number of different things. I want to say something about people on the front lines. There are the people that are first responders and medical personnel, but there's also retail workers. There's workers in sections like meatpacking that I consider frontline. And basically they've been declared to be essential. And the criminality of what we're looking at, which is part of what I think the labor movement needs to harness, that sense of criminality is there, that people are being told to sacrifice themselves on the altar of capitalism. It's that blatant. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor of Texas back in March came out and basically said that 
older people needed to be prepared to sacrifice themselves for the economy. Many people suggested that he being older should take the first step and the rest of us would consider our options afterwards. Uh, he never did. But that gives you an idea as to what the climate is. And so I think that there's this real fight that has to be taken about defending people who are on the front lines. Because clearly this administration doesn't give a damn about them. So that needs to be politicized. I guess that's, that's part of my answer to your question. Um, the, the, uh, the other part of the atomization, I don't have an answer to that. Um, I, I think that this, this society has been, and I think most capitalist societies have become increasingly atomized over the last 50 years. I think that one result of the COVID crisis may be that we become less atomized because the desperation for human contact is palatable everywhere. Um, and the, um, the post-traumatic stress that we're gonna be suffering on I think a massive scale is gonna necessitate a lot of human contact. And that may be the only positive thing that comes out of this crisis. Um, but this atomization, the atomization and the lack of tactical creativity, I think has created a certain level of despair. That's as best an answer as I can give you. It's a good answer. It's uh, interesting to note how many similar things we've we've got happening here. We've got our own right wingers basically sacrificing older people on the altar of capitalism, and we've got um, car convoy happened in Sydney uh, for May Day. So we've got a few uh, echoes around the world. Uh, we've yep. got a convener of our. US-UK Solidarity Group, uh, Richard Walsham, who's uh, on the line there in Sydney. Richard, go ahead. Yep, thanks. Uh, thanks, Bill. Um, my question is, what's your take on the view that Bernie has taken the fear out of the word socialism and made it more difficult for the political right to constantly scare people by use of the term? Do you think there is a viable path for the forces around Bernie to continue with an effective mass presence after the election is all over, given that Bernie's talked a lot about how it wasn't just me, it was us, and that he was involved in a movement. Um, thank you. Part of that I tried to answer in my initial presentation, but I'm gonna give you an additional answer. Um, so has Bernie taken the fear out of the word socialism? No. Um, I think that over the last, the first evidence that the attitude towards the, the notion of socialism was changing occurred during the Obama administration. Um, and what was happening among youth was an increased favorability towards socialism, in part because Obama was being attacked as a socialist. And people said, well, you know, he doesn't seem like he's that bad, so maybe I'm a socialist. And so you started seeing this openness. And then you had things like Occupy, the Occupy movement. So we've been on a certain trajectory. That's one part of the answer. Um, the second is the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union has eliminated a certain imagery that um, the right wing has been trying to replace by pointing to the problems in Venezuela and other places, but is not, can't be as successfully pointed to as one could have 
during the Cold War. Um, now, that said, I think that many Bernie supporters completely underestimated anti-communism. Uh, they underestimated it in 2016, and I would regularly hear people say, if Bernie had gotten the nomination, he would have crushed Trump. And I said, I'm not so sure. Um, I said, if Bernie had gotten a nomination in 2016, we would have seen a level of anti-communism and Jew baiting unlike anything we've seen in decades. Um, and I think it was completely naive to think that anti-communism had gone the way of the dodo bird uh, or that anti-Semitism would have been insignificant. And I feel like I've been vindicated when we look at what started to happen as Sanders' campaign increased in significance in the 2020 election. Um, the, uh, the right wing was, to a great extent, uh, elated at the possibilities of being able to red bait all Democratic Party candidates. And, uh, and so I think that um, uh, we would have seen, again, an immense amount of red baiting and anti-Semitism. Um, and there's an underappreciation in the United States of the depth of anti-Semitism. Uh, we completely mythologize this notion of so-called Judeo-Christian values, failing to recognize that mainstream Christianity despises Jews. And it always has. And sometimes they're just very open about it. Most of the time they're kind of closed about it, but they despise Jews. And that anti-Semitism touches a lot of mainstream Christianity and, um, and resonates there. And so, and there would have been, as we see right now, these anti-Semitic uh, attacks on people like George Soros and others. Now, having said this, I go back to the 70 million. So uh, these various opinion polls indicate, have indicated consistently that about a third uh, of the population is open to alternatives to socialism, alternatives to capitalism. And that's really remarkable when you think about it. Um, you know, here we are in the middle of a settler state, a racist settler state, and yet a third of the population, and I don't mean that everyone has uh, ordered the most recent version of the collected works of Lenin or something, right? But, but I'm saying that people are willing to explore possibilities. And that gives us a tremendous basis to be excited. I, I'm, I'm thrilled by it. I just think we, we on the left are completely unprepared because instead of, you know, we tend to think in terms of dozens of people. Um, maybe if we're being ambitious, hundreds, but rarely do we think about thousands and certainly not millions. So we've got to change our framework and it really does mean changing the way we think about organization. You can't just be thinking about an organization of people you like, which is what happened. I don't know how it is in Australia, but in the United States, the kind of splits we have when people just don't like each other or, you know, someone has used the wrong term, you know, or they didn't use the right pronoun. And then, oh, we got to have a split. Pull out the AK-47s, right? Um, now, in terms of the second question um, about the Sanders movement, this is, this is a tough question be, for a number of reasons. One, Sanders is not an organization builder, and he never has been. Um, Sanders is the quintessential populist who sees organization as an, as an inhibiting factor to his relationship with his base. You know, sort of like a problem with all due respect to the late Hugo Chavez, who I had great admiration for. But Chavez 
as Chavez often looked at organization as an inconvenience. It was like sort of getting in the way of his relationship with the masses. And, um, and this became a real problem as we saw with the development of the PSUV in, in uh, the Party for Socialist, Socialist Unity in Venezuela. Um, Sanders, I had a discussion with Sanders. This is probably more information you want to know. But in the late 1980s, after Sanders had stepped down as mayor of Burlington, Vermont, was trying to decide what to do next, was preparing for his congressional race. I had lunch with him. And this was in Boston, Massachusetts. And I um, was involved in a project. And I was trying to identify people that might be interested in a sort of post-Jesse Jackson rainbow political configuration that would look at working inside and outside of the Democratic Party. And um, I met with, with Sanders to try to explore whether he'd be interested in this. And Sanders was very polite, very friendly, and did a dance that would have pleased Fred Astaire. I mean, he, could, he would not give me an answer. He just danced around the question to the point that it was clear that was not, he wasn't interested. So Sanders himself is not someone you can ever look to to build an organization. He believes in the idea of organization. And we should take that and utilize that, that he believes in organization. But the building of organization is going to fall to other people. Now, after his 2016 campaign, he helped launch this thing called Our Revolution, which basically ended up being a failure. It was a mass organization, uh, but it lacked energy, strategic direction, and it lacked something that the Sanders campaign of 2016, and I would argue 2020 have lacked, which is tapping into veteran activists, and particularly veteran activists of color. Um, one of the problems in the 2016 Sanders campaign was that Sanders likes to surround himself with people that he's comfortable with. And most of those people tend to be white people from Vermont. And this becomes a problem. Uh, and so even though in 2020, he expanded his uh, campaign and it became more demographically diverse, he still would, could not or would not tap into veteran activists of color to serve in strategic positions. They could speak for him, but not in terms of development of strategy. And so the construction of something else necessitates a rethinking of who's at the core. Now, there are a number of very interesting possibilities. I mentioned some in my remarks. There's something called the Working Families Party, which has just recently gone through an organizational uh, leadership transition. And there's a young executive director, uh, African-American, um, some younger people that are being brought in. Um, there are, and they, they have national ambitions, not as a third party, but as a political force to operate inside and outside of the Democratic Party. There are these other state organizations, I mentioned one, the New Virginia Majority, that um, also has great potential. And a number of these organizations share the politics of Sanders. Um, so I think that there's really interesting possibilities. But the final point is something that I learned in the 1980s after, in the context of the African-American led electoral insurgency that starts around 1979 and peaked uh, with Jesse Jackson's campaign in 1988. And that is that 
it is very hard to build an ongoing political organization out of an electoral campaign. That people get involved in election campaigns for different reasons than they join organizations. And one of the reasons that that is the case is that when you join an electoral campaign, there's one thing that you know with complete certainty, it will end. When you join a political organization, it's not so certain, except in the kind of ultimate sense, right? So you can join a political campaign and you can despise half of the people in the campaign, but you know that after election day, you don't have to deal with them ever again in life. Um, and so people will join those campaigns because they believe in the issues or whatever, but then at the end of the election, just walk away. And even when the campaign has great levels of enthusiasm, the notion of capturing that into an ongoing organization is something that is very, very difficult. Uh, and I've seen this tempted time and again uh, in the 1980s, in um, the aftermath of Obama's campaign, that there are a core of people, in the best, the best case, there are a core of people that come out of a campaign that can build an organization, but you have to build that organization in a way, in such a way that you are factoring in that the candidate will not be there. That you can't build the organization based on the assumption that the candidate will be there and continue to rally the troops. The candidate is going to be moving on in most cases. And, um, and, and when you rely on the candidate to keep rallying the, the troops, you're setting yourself up for um, major disappointments. So I would say that the Sanders campaign has helped to energize some of these folks at the base that have been in operation and have been developing their politics for a while. And I'm excited about that. And I'm hoping that they can convene some sort of left progressive electoral front that can be an ongoing formation. Uh, and we'll see. I guess the last thing I'd, I'd say um, about this is that it was very interesting in the lead up to Sanders' uh, campaign in 2020. There were many of us that were disappointed that when, after the 2016 campaign, that Sanders didn't identify some younger people and basically take them under his wing and help to advance them as um, uh, his successors. I mean, there, you know, it's interesting. Uh, there was a candidate, Julian Castro, um, who I thought was really quite amazing. And, and he's young, at least he's younger than me. Um, and he's, uh, you know, he's the kind of person that we needed Sanders to put his arms around and encourage forward. Um, because Sanders is an old man. And he was an old man in 2016. And, you know, with all due respect to old people, there are certain habits that many of us have. And, um, and even though Sanders was able to connect with many younger people, he was very obstinate. And, um, and we needed something else. We needed something more flexible. So there were many people that were reluctant, people that had been Santa supporters in 2016, 
that was saying, maybe it's time for a younger person. Um, but there really wasn't a younger candidate in the race who, significantly younger candidate, who had the politics and had assembled the kind of movement that Sanders had. I know you like to quote from movies. It makes me think of the uh, Godfather. Just didn't have enough time, Michael. Um, on that point. <laughs> right, correct. <laughs> we are running uh, now. We've taken up a lot of your time, but um, maybe if it's all right to get one more question, which is related to what you've just been talking about. I'm uh, fine. I'm awake. So it's like, awake. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm awake. You know, it's not like I'm going to be going back to sleep now. So, uh, you know. Well, it's, it's directly related to what you were just talking about um, from Dr. Anitra Nelson. Go ahead, uh, Anitra. Uh, Bill, yes, I want to ask you, can you imagine any woman becoming a United States president in the near future? Yes, absolutely. But I think that, um, and this is something that I underestimated in 2016. Um, I really did underestimate how many men and women um, have believed that it is unacceptable for a woman to be president? Um, and, and, you know, in, in the 21st century, I mean, it's just, it's like you look around the world and you see country after country with women as presidents uh, or prime ministers. And, um, and yet in the United States, you have a significant constituency that says no. Um, and the way that it plays out and has played out, I, I've noticed um, in the 1980s when uh, Walter Mondale picked Geraldine Ferraro to be his vice presidential running mate, the attacks on her were really remarkable. I mean, it was not uncommon, forgive the expression, for people to say, Ferraro is nothing but a bitch. Now, um, there was no political backing to that comment. You know what I mean? It's not like someone says, well, Ferraro did this and that and this, and therefore she's a bitch. It just, it was just as if that statement should summarize everything. Um, the attacks on Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Uh, and this is where I've differed from, with uh, some folks on the left. Um, there, there were many folks on the left who uh, took the position that the attacks on Clinton were largely driven by the hatred of neoliberalism and the hatred of the dynamic duo of Bill Clinton and Hillary. And... Uh, and, and, and such things. And while that was certainly a factor, um, nothing but misogynism can explain the difference in the treatment of Hillary Clinton to Donald Trump during the election. Um, the, for example, during one of the debates, Trump was hovering around Hillary. Now, if Hillary had turned to him and said something like, who the hell do you think you are? Right? People would have said, oh, what a bitch. Right? But if, if, Trump had done that to Sanders, and Sanders had said something, 
people would say, oh, right on, Bernie. Kick him in his ass, right? And, and so there's this differential. Women political candidates are, are absolutely held to a different standard. Um, and it's the, the parallel is with Obama, the, which is that Obama was constantly worried about being perceived as the angry black man. Because you see, black folks can't get angry. We are not permitted to get publicly angry. Um, <clears throat> anytime we get angry uh, and express outrage, we are perceived, we are portrayed as being irrational, have a chip on our shoulder, or whatever. Trump can be xenophobic, he can be obnoxious, he can uh, be openly misogynist, and people say, oh, that's just how he is. You don't have to like him, you just have to like his politics. And so, so for both women and people of color, there is this standard and these parameters that we're operating within that make it really difficult. Um, and so, so, so the answer going back again is, yes, a woman can be president of the United States. I'm convinced of it. Um, the, but there are gonna be these sizable obstacles. And, and so, much like Obama, you can't screw up. You simply can't screw up. And I realize that that holds someone to a very high standard. But let me give you an example. Elizabeth Warren really screwed up. When she, um, the whole way she handled the Native American question, uh, claiming Native American heritage. Well, now let's just be clear. A lot of people have Native American heritage. I do, right? But I don't walk around saying that I'm part Shawnee, right? I, that, I'm not, that's not my identification. It's part of my bloodline. And, but you'd never see that on an application. And that was like a major screw up. But on top of that, not consulting with Native Americans before the whole blood test thing, it was just like a major debacle and played right into Trump's hands. You know, it's, it's, that was one of the brilliant things about Obama uh, and his campaigns that you could disagree with him, and I vehemently disagree with him on many things, but he was keenly aware that the other side was gonna be constantly looking for a weakness in the armor. And what we're gonna to have to make sure is that the candidates that we support both don't screw up, but also that we're able to shout down our opponents, uh, whether those opponents are using misogynism or anti-communism, racism or, or anti-Semitism. Um, so I certainly haven't given up. That seems like an appropriate uh, note for us to, to, uh, to finish on. And thank you for uh, being there with us and for giving us so much of your time, an hour and a half uh, on a, at 5 o'clock in the morning till 6.30 a.m. It's been brilliant. We do have further questions, but we might have to um, just discuss those. Um, people can uh, now um, uh, mess send messages to you um, uh, on the chat section if they like um, and post other links and things and also talk again as I said in the um, chat section of our Facebook event but um, it's my um, great pleasure to thank you so much for being there and giving us this fascinating insight into uh, the prospects for the left in uh, the USA and answering all these questions um, uh, you know it's fascinating and, and it's just been wonderful thank you so much for being there sure I'll give you the, la the, the final uh, say to say anything that you like. And then, as I said, uh, as we always do, we'll give a, um, uh, a bit of, I'll play a, a song for everyone 
as we uh, leave the meeting and people can write in the um, uh, chat section during that or just simply hang up. And then once that's uh, concluded, uh, we'll finish the event. But thank you so much, Bill. Um, and thank you everyone for being here and joining us. And thanks to all our questioners. Sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but um, we'll have to uh, invite you on again if we can get you at another time. No, absolutely. And let me just make this uh, my final point, which is a, a point that I've been emphasizing almost every time I speak. Um, we are not facing the end of the world. We're facing the end of a moment. And one of the big problems on the left is that the response of too many leftists to the COVID-19 slash economic collapse has been one of apocalyptic thinking and writing. Um, you see a lot of this on Facebook um, and uh, people posting these analyses, usually very long, by the way, um, too long, that describe everything that's wrong. And, uh, you know, all of the hundreds of thousands of people that will be dying, the complete economic uncertainty, and, and uh, to paraphrase uh, uh, someone who will go nameless in the United States who wrote a piece basically saying that these are the good times compared to what we're getting ready to enter. Um, but they don't provide any sense of hope or strategic direction. And I think that that's inexcusable. That is absolutely inexcusable. That I, 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 a friend of mine posted something on Facebook a few weeks ago that was completely apocalyptic. He, it was some article from someone else. And I happened to read it. It was, oh my God, it was terrible. I was just like, one thing after another about how bad it is. So I said to my friend uh, in response, I said, if you really believe this, then we should pass out the Kool-Aid and call it a day. Now that's a reference to the Jonestown massacre of 1979 when people drank the poison Kool-Aid. I said, or we should get a lot of marijuana and stay high. Because basically what you're saying is it's hopeless. There's nothing that can be done. And I said, if you believe that, then that's what you should do. But if you don't believe that, you have no business posting this kind of nonsense. And I really, I'm, I'm on a war, on the war path on this. And I think it's really important that we understand that each time we present an apocalyptic scenario, we are further demobilizing and driving into despair people that listen to us. When, as opposed to saying, Things are going to be rough. You know, um, you know, it's like I was joking with some people and I, about this. I said, you know, reading all this stuff on Facebook, could you imagine in December 1941, after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, the Joint Chiefs of Staff sitting in Washington saying, oh, my God, it's all going to hell. We're going to lose everything. Oh, I can't see any possibility of victory. Oh, God, it's so tough. Can you imagine that? I can't, right? You know that from the moment that the attack, they were starting to plan a counterattack and figure out what was even, even when every island was falling to the Japanese, even when your own homeland, Australia, was being threatened with invasion. People were saying, okay, that's the reality. Now, what are we going to do? We on the left have to take the same attitude. Things are bad, that's right. Things are gonna get worse, that's right. Thousands of people are gonna die, no question about it. Possibly millions of people are gonna die, no question. Hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, are gonna be out of work, no question about it. So what the hell are we going to do? And my attitude is if you don't have an answer, then shut up. Just shut up, go into your room, watch reruns of Star Trek, right? And stop bothering me and stop bothering the rest of us. Unless you are interested in grappling with the answers, I have absolutely no interest 
in your analysis. None. And that's what I'm telling people. And that's what I'd say to you. Because my guess is that in Australia, you have the same kind of characters that are saying doom and gloom. There is no hope. It's all going to collapse. We, start, we need to start getting canned food and our rifles and preparing for a scenario out of Road Warrior, right? And it's like, in Spanish, the word is basta, which means enough. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We're getting a lot of applause from everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Take care. All the best. We have to uh, now okay. go to, uh, we've had a lot of enjoyment of um, some reggae. Uh, we're going to go for some uh, some hip hop now. So uh, some a, band, a group from um, uh, Bill's hometown, a tribe called from New York called Tribe Called Quest. And uh, I hope that um, everyone leaves their comments in the uh, the group chat there and enjoys enjoys these tunes as we uh, as we say goodbye. This is uh, We the People by a tribe called Quest. <laughs> 